I made a worksheet you can fill out as you watch this video, plus practice problems for this unit, and AP Calculus practice tests to help you get ready for the AP test. So click the link in the description to check those out. Remember that in Unit 1, we talked about limits and continuity, both of which will apply here in Unit 2. And everything we learn here about derivatives is going to be foundational for Units 3 through 5, because in those units, we'll dive deeper into derivative rules and derivative applications. This unit's probably a little bit easier than the others, because a lot of the questions that will be asked on the AP test from this unit are just going to be a matter of correctly applying the derivative formulas. But for the sake of moving quickly through the exam, you'll definitely want to have all of the derivative formulas from this unit memorized. We want to start Unit 2 by talking about average versus instantaneous rate of change and how we use the difference quotient to calculate average rate of change. So the best way to remember this concept is with a graph. And if we think about our goal as calculating the instantaneous rate of change at a particular point, so let's say here that we have this point of tangency here, and we want to calculate the instantaneous rate of change at that point, or the slope of the function at that point. Well, the way that calculus does that, really, is by changing the average rate of change into the instantaneous rate of change. So if we look at these different points along the function, we could calculate an average rate of change, for instance, over this interval here, from this point on the left to this point on the right. But if we narrow the interval, if we bring both of those points in closer toward this point we're interested in, we could calculate an average rate of change over this interval, then an average rate of change over this interval. And what happens is that as we bring those points closer and closer to the point of tangency, so we bring this point here in closer, and we bring this point here in closer, then eventually those points get so close to each other, so we get them in here and here next to this point that we're interested in, the points get so close to each other until eventually we narrow the gap between the points to as close to zero as possible without actually being zero, and that's going to give us the instantaneous rate of change at that point. So remember, it's the difference quotient that gives us average rate of change, and we can either write that as f of a plus h minus f of a, and then divided by h, or an equivalent expression is to write this as f of x minus f of a all divided by x minus a. These are both formulas for the difference quotient. They mean the same thing. The difference is that this formula here on the right, it's as if we're saying that this point here is the point x, and that this point here is the point a, and then we use this difference quotient formula to get the average rate of change between those two points. With this first formula, the formula here on the left, we're using h, the value of h, as the distance between a and x. So whatever this distance is here, whatever that value is, that's the value that we would use for h. And so they really calculate the same thing. They mean the same thing. It's just two different ways of expressing the difference quotient. And the idea is that let's say that this point over here on the left is at, we'll call it 1, 3, and this point up here on the right, we'll call this, let's say, 9 and maybe 6. We say that to calculate the difference quotient, we'll use this formula here on the right, the value of the function at x, well, x is here at 9, the value of the function there is 6, so we would say 6 and then minus f of a, well, over here at a, a is 1, the value of the function is 3, so we get 3, and then we divide that by x minus a. Well, that's 9 minus 1, so 9 minus 1, and we get 3 over 8. So the average rate of change of this function between x equals 1 and x equals 9 is 3 eighths, which means that for every one unit we move horizontally, we move up vertically 3 eighths of a unit, about half a unit. That's on average how fast the function is increasing between 1 and 9. And then, of course, if we use this formula, we would say that the distance between 1 and 9 is 8. So we would say we have f of 1 plus 8 minus f of 1. And then we would divide that by h, which is 8. 
and we'd get f of 9 minus f of 1 divided by 8. And we know that f of 9 is 6 and f of 1 is 3. So we end up with 6 minus 3 over 8 or 3 eighths. The important thing here is that you know how to do this from a graph. If you're given a graph like this to use these points to calculate the difference quotient, you may be given these values in a table. This point here, 1, 3, this point, 9, 6, maybe some other points along the graph. You're given those values in a table and you need to plug into the difference quotient. But either way, that's how you're using the difference quotient to calculate average rate of change. In 2.2, we're transitioning from the difference quotient to the definition of the derivative. So in the last topic, we said that the difference quotient was given in one of two ways, either as f of a plus h minus f of a over h, where h was the distance between the two points, or as f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. These were equivalent expressions for the difference quotient. Well, to turn these into expressions that define the derivative, we simply apply a limit to both of them. So for the first formula, we say the limit as h approaches zero, because what that does is narrow the distance. Remember, h is the distance between the two points. This narrows the distance between the two points until it gets as close as possible to zero, but not actually zero, thereby changing the average rate of change that was given by the difference quotient into the instantaneous rate of change, which is given by this, which is now the definition of the derivative. And then same thing here, except that we say the limit as x approaches a. And what that does, remember with this formula, x is one point along the x-axis, a is another point along the x-axis. So by taking x to a, we're just bringing those two points closer and closer together. In either case, we're pulling the points together so they get closer and closer, narrowing that interval until the points are exactly the same and we have instantaneous rate of change derived out of average rate of change by changing the difference quotient into the definition of the derivative. So both of these formulas, we can say express the derivative at a. And so they're both equal to f prime of a which brings us to a point about derivative notation. We usually see the derivative written as f prime of x or as y prime or sometimes as dy over dx. All three of these mean the same thing. They all represent the first derivative of the function and we need to know that we can use them interchangeably, that they represent the same derivative function. What we wanna be able to do is use this definition of the derivative to calculate the derivative and then use that derivative to find an equation for the tangent line at a particular point. So for instance, if we're given a simple function like f of x is equal to x squared plus one, and we wanna be able to find instantaneous rate of change or find the derivative, and let's say we wanna find that derivative at a equals three. Well, we can use this second formula here for the definition of the derivative. We could use either one. But let's use the second one and we'll say that first f prime at a is equal to the limit as x approaches a of f of x. Well, that's x squared plus 1 minus f of a. We can find that by substituting a into our function here. So that's a squared plus 1. We can't forget these parentheses because we need to distribute that negative sign. And then we divide by x minus a. Now we're interested in the derivative at a equals three or the instantaneous rate of change at a equals three. So we'll plug three into this derivative equation and we'll say the limit as x approaches three of x squared. Then here, if we plug in a equals three, we get three squared is nine, nine plus one is 10. So here we have one minus 10, that's a negative nine. So we get minus nine and then divided by x minus three. And then we know that we can factor this numerator to get x plus 3, x minus 3, and then divide that by x minus 3. That'll get our x minus 3 factors to cancel, leaving us with just x plus 3. And then if we apply our limit and say the limit is x goes to 3, we evaluate this at 3, and we get 3 plus 3 
is equal to 6, which tells us that the instantaneous rate of change of this function at 3 is equal to 6, or the slope of the function at that point is 6. So we just want to be comfortable plugging into this definition of the derivative formula, not only using it to calculate the derivative itself, but using it to find instantaneous rate of change at a point. And we need to be able to do that using the function here, using a graph, using a table of values, and translating that information into both of these definition of the derivative formulas. Topic 2.3 is all about estimating derivatives from information either about the function, the graph, uh, values given in a table. So we want to look at a couple of examples like that. And let's say we're asked to estimate the derivative of the function at x equals 3. So that looks like it's right about here. Well, one way to do that from the graph is to look at the points on either side of x equals 3 and then use those values along the graph to plug into the difference quotient. So at x equals 2, it looks like the graph is approximately here, and at x equals 4, it looks like the graph is approximately here. So if we go over onto the y-axis, I would say that this point looks like it's about at, I don't know, 5.2. So the value there is 5.2. And then this point right here looks like it's about 3.5 maybe. And you'll be given a more accurate graph than this when it comes to the AP test. But the point is to get these values from the graph and then simply to plug into the difference quotient. So remember that the difference quotient tells us that we can take f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. Well, in our case, we'll call this x, we'll call this a. Therefore, this is f of x, and this is f of a, and so we plug in and we get 3.5 minus 5.2, and then we have x minus a, 4 minus 2, so 4 minus 2, and when we simplify there, we get negative 1.7 divided by positive 2. That gives us negative 0.85. And a quick double check is to try to draw a tangent line approximation at that point. That's approximately the slope. And that does look like it could be a negative slope of about negative 0.85. So it looks like that is the derivative that is the instantaneous rate of change at that point. We also want to be able to estimate here from tables. And the idea is exactly the same. So if we're asked to find the instantaneous rate of change or the derivative at x equals 4, so the question might be something like, find f prime of 4. Well, that's just the derivative at 4. That's the instantaneous rate of change at 4. So we can again use the difference quotient, and we just take the values on either side of that value, and we plug them in. So we'll say here that in our numerator, so f of x minus f of a over x minus a is equal to, we'll say, 4 minus 1 because we're going to call this here f of x, we're going to call this f of a, and we're going to call this x and a. And you could flip these around. You could make this over here on the right, a and f of a, and this over here on the left, x and f of x. It doesn't matter as long as you keep it consistent here, because the value is going to come out correctly both ways. But in this case, if we assign values that way, we'll say 4 minus 1 divided by 5 minus 3 is going to give us 3 over 2, or in decimal form if we want to, 1.5. So our instantaneous rate of change, our derivative, and of course this is an estimate, same as when we were estimating with the graph, but our estimate for the derivative at x equals 4 for the function f of x is 1.5. It's a slope of 1.5, which of course is a positive slope, so that means the function is increasing there. So those are some of the kinds of problems you're going to see, estimating from a graph, estimating from a table. We definitely want to be comfortable with both. For 2.4, there's a couple really important points that we need to remember. First is that if a function is differentiable, then it is also continuous by definition. Because as we'll see, if a function is discontinuous, it cannot be differentiable. So if you're told that a function is differentiable, you automatically know it must also be continuous. 
And that's, of course, at the particular point that you're talking about. So we're saying if a function is differentiable at x equals 2, that means it also must, by definition, be continuous at x equals 2. That's not necessarily saying that it's differentiable and or continuous at every other point in its domain, but at that particular point, if it's differentiable, it's continuous. The second point is, if the function is continuous, it's not necessarily differentiable. So the opposite statement to the first is not true. A function can be continuous and not differentiable. For example, if the function has a sharp point, which we call a cusp, or if it's oscillating back and forth really quickly, the function is continuous, but it's not necessarily differentiable, and it's not differentiable because it's not smooth. And we'll look at an example of that in a second. And then the third point is what we referred to in the first point, which is that if a function is discontinuous at a particular point, you know immediately it is not differentiable at that same point. So really, when we talk about differentiability, we say that it comes back to two things. There's two things that we need to remember about differentiability. Continuity is the first one. And then smoothness is the second one. It needs to be smooth. So for a function to be differentiable at a particular point, it must be both continuous and smooth. If it's continuous but not smooth, it won't be differentiable. If it's smooth but not continuous, it won't be differentiable. We require both of these conditions in order for the function to be differentiable. And we can see that really clearly in examples like this where we have a piecewise defined function. So the piecewise function here is telling us that this piece defines the function for all x less than or equal to 3, and that this second piece, negative x plus 6, defines the function for everything x greater than 3. So what we can do is sketch this out. This is good to know how to do. One easy way to do this is to draw in the curves as they are and then just erase the parts that don't fit the given interval. So for instance here, we know that this first piece is the equation y equals x, and we know what that line looks like. It goes through the origin here, and it passes through the point 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. We'll leave that for a second. And then this second piece here is essentially y equals negative x plus 6. Well, we know that that's going to intersect the y-axis at 6. That's the y-intercept. And then it has a slope of negative 1. That means it's also going to pass through the point 6, 0. So we can go ahead and sketch in that line. So this is what our curves look like unrestricted. But now let's look at the domains here or the intervals. So we're told that this first piece defines the function for everything x less than or equal to 3. So if we come here to 3, that piece defines the function for everything over here on the left, but nothing over here on the right. So what we can do is erase this whole part up to x equals 3, because this piece doesn't account for an interval greater than 3. The second piece accounts for everything x greater than 3, which means it defines the function to the right of x equals 3, but not to the left of it. So we can go ahead and erase everything that we drew over here. And now this is the graph of our piecewise defined function. What we see is that we do have continuity for this function at x equals 3 from this little equal sign right here of the less than or equal sign. That tells us that right at x equals 3, the function is defined by the piece y equals x. And so it does, in fact, have this point included in its graph. It's the point 3, 3. That's part of its domain. That's part of its graph. So it meets the continuity criterion. But it does not meet the smoothness criterion because we have a cusp here, which is this sharp corner. And when we have this sharp corner, we do not have smoothness. The graph is not smooth. And therefore, we would say that at this particular point, while the function is continuous, it's not smooth. And because it's not smooth, it cannot be differentiable at that particular point. So we will not be able to find its derivative or define its derivative at that particular point. On the other hand, let's say at x equals 5, if we were to look at this point, at that point, the function is both smooth and continuous. There's no break in continuity there. The function is continuous coming in from the left-hand side, coming in from the right-hand side. There's no break in the function. It's continuous. And it's also smooth. There's no abrupt shift in the graph at that point. The function's not oscillating. There's no cusp like this. So it's continuous and smooth. And therefore, at that point, the function would be 
differentiable, we would be able to find the derivative or find the slope of the function at x equals 5, but just not at x equals 3 because of the lack of smoothness. Topic 2.5 is all about applying the power rule. That's going to be our simplest derivative rule. And it just tells us that when we have something like x to the fifth power, this is a power function, we bring the exponent down in front and we subtract one from the exponent. The base stays the same. So our derivative here, when we take the derivative of x to the fifth, we bring the five down in front and we get x to the five minus one or x to the four. Remember that when we have a coefficient out in front, so let's say we have this time 3x to the fourth, that coefficient stays the same. So the derivative then is 3 times 4. We bring the exponent down to multiply it by that coefficient of 3. The base stays the same, and we get 4 minus 1, or 3, which is going to be equal to 12x cubed. Remember also that nothing changes if you have a negative exponent. So if we instead had 3x to the negative 4, we still just follow the same rule multiplying that negative exponent by the coefficient and then subtracting one from the exponent. So here we get negative 4 minus 1, and that's equal to negative 12x to the negative 5. Keep in mind on the AP test that they may take this negative 12x to the negative 5 and move the x to the negative 5 to the denominator to make that exponent positive. And so you might see this written as negative 12 over x to the positive 5, and these are equivalent expressions, so you got to watch out for that. Remember, of course, also that if you have something like, instead of 3x to the negative 4, if you have 3 over x to the 4th, you can differentiate that using power rule by moving the x to the 4th up to the numerator to get 3x to the negative 4, and then the derivative of that you can take using power rule, and you again end up with negative 12x to the negative 5. Topic 2.6 just builds on what we know about power rule already. So the first thing we want to start with is the fact that the derivative of any constant is 0. So that means that the derivative of 3 is going to be 0. The derivative of negative 6 is going to be 0. The derivative of pi, because it's a constant, it's about 3.14, it's going to be 0. And the derivative of just e, e to the first power, or e, without a variable in the exponent, that's a constant, it's about 2.7, that'll also be zero. So we have the derivative of a constant. We also know the derivative of a sum of power terms when we think about a polynomial. So when we have something like x cubed plus 3x squared plus one, we have a polynomial function, a sum of power terms. When we take the derivative of this, we know that we can just differentiate one term at a time. So the derivative of this polynomial, we start with the x cubed and we use power rule to get 3x squared. To differentiate 3x squared, we use power rule to get 6x. And then to differentiate 1, we know the derivative of any constant is 0, so we get plus 0. And then, of course, the final answer for the derivative, we can just drop the 0 and get 3x squared plus 6x. The same is true if we're subtracting terms. So even if we had x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1. The fact that we have subtraction here doesn't change the rules that we're using, it just means we keep that negative sign. So the derivative then of this is 3x squared, then we keep our negative sign, and we get 6x and then plus 0. So the derivative is just 3x squared minus 6x. In topic 2.7, we learn about the derivatives of sine and cosine. So really important that we memorize these for the AP exam because they'll come up so often that we want to have them committed to memory so that we can move quickly through the questions. So the derivative of sine of x we know is cosine of x, and the derivative of cosine of x we know is negative sine of x. Now the interesting thing here is that notice that the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. So if we were to then differentiate negative sine of x again, well, we can sort of separate this negative sign from the sine of x. We know that the sine of x derivative is cosine of x, so the derivative would be negative cosine of x. We really want to think about it this way. If we start with sine of x and we take the derivative, we get cosine of x. 
if we take the derivative of cosine of x, we get negative sine of x. If we take the derivative again, we get negative cosine of x. And if we take the derivative of negative cosine of x, we get back to sine of x. So keep this pattern of derivatives in mind so that no matter where you are on this circle, you can move to just the next derivative when you have to differentiate one of these functions. So this is really important to remember. Then we also know that the derivative of the exponential function e to the x, we'll use this one all the time, the derivative is just e to the x. It's exactly the same thing. And even if we have some constant coefficient, so for example, if we have 3 e to the x, the derivative there will keep the constant coefficient and it'll still be 3 e to the x. Same thing up here. The derivative of 3 sine of x would be 3 cosine of x. The derivative of 2 cosine x would be negative 2 sine x. So we keep those constant coefficients in all of these rules. And then lastly, the derivative of the natural log function. So natural log of x, the derivative there is going to be 1 over x. And same thing if we had a constant coefficient, let's say negative 2 natural log of x, the derivative of that function, we keep the negative 2, and then the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x, so we multiply, and that of course simplifies to negative 2 over x. All these derivative formulas for sine, cosine, the exponential, and natural log functions, you definitely want to have memorized for both your final exam and your AP test. In topic 2.8, we talk about the product rule, which, as you know, says that the derivative of the product of two functions, we'll call them f and g, is the derivative of one of them multiplied by the other one, plus the first one times the derivative of the other one. So, of course, we apply this to all kinds of product functions. Let's say that we have 6x sine of x, and we want to find its derivative. Well, we have the product here of two functions. One is 6x, and the other is sine of x. So... Let's consider these as separate functions. Then we say the derivative of 6x is 6, and then we leave sine of x alone. And then we add to that, this time we leave 6x alone, and take the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x. And then you always want to simplify. So 6 sine x plus 6x cosine x, and that's our derivative. We could also do this, let's say, with the product of an exponential function. So we'll say e to the x and another power function. So how about x to the third? This time, when we take the derivative, we again follow product rule. We take the derivative of e to the x, which is still just e to the x, and we leave x cubed alone. And then we add the opposite situation. This time we leave the e to the x alone, and we differentiate the x cubed, and that's 3x squared. And then we simplify and we get x cubed e to the x plus 3x squared e to the x. And keep in mind on the AP test, as always, they'll rewrite things in a different form. So here, for instance, we could factor out an x squared e to the x. And when we factor that out, we're left with x plus 3. So the derivative could be given as this expression here because it's just a rewritten version of the same derivative. So we need to be able to apply product rule. And then another common problem that you're going to want to see and know how to handle is something like this. So you have a table of values, or you could be given graphs, and you'll see the curves and be able to identify specific points on the graphs of each function. But nevertheless, you have a certain set of values here, and then you're given a function. So we have the function h of x equal to the product of f of x and g of x minus 4 times f of x. And then we're asked for the value of the derivative function at x equals 3, and we need to find that. So remember, for these kinds of problems, what we want to do, since we need the derivative of h, we have to take the derivative of h of x here. Well, notice that, of course, we're going to need to use product rule to do that because we have the product of f and g. So when we use the product rule on h of x, we say that h prime of x is equal to, we apply product rule directly, so we'll say f prime of x leaving g of x alone, and then add to that. This time we leave f of x alone, multiply by g prime of x. There's our product rule application on the first term. Then the derivative here on minus 4 f of x, we get minus 4 f prime of x. There's our derivative function. Then when we want to evaluate it at 3, we just plug 3 in for x. So we say 
h prime of 3 is equal to, and we just plug in 3 for every x value. So we're going to need here f of 3, we're going to need g prime of 3, and then minus 4, we're going to need f prime of 3. And then once we have this form, we can just pull values directly from our table. So f prime of 3, we come up here to f prime at 3, that value is negative 2. Keep in mind here that the row of values for x equals 4 is just there to throw you off. You don't need it. You only need the row with the values at x equals 3. So g of 3 is 1. So we say 1. Then we get f of 3. That's 7. g prime at 3 is 6. Minus 4. f prime of 3 is negative 2. And now all we have to do is simplify. Negative 2 plus 42 minus a negative. We have to multiply those to get a positive 8. And so h prime of 3 is 48. These are the kinds of product rule problems that you want to watch out for on the AP test. After product rule, we want to talk about quotient rule, which is the rule that we use to take the derivative of rational functions or fractions. And it says that when we take the derivative of a function f of x divided by another function g of x, so we define the numerator with f of x and the denominator with g of x, then this is the formula that we follow in order to find the derivative. And of course, you want this formula memorized as well. Let's apply it to an example. So let's say that we want to take the derivative of x squared over natural log of x. We're going to apply quotient rule and take the derivative of the numerator, well, that's 2x, multiplied by the denominator, that's ln of x. Then we're going to subtract from that the numerator, so x squared, times the derivative of the denominator. Well, the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x, and then we divide that by the square of the denominator. So we say natural log of x squared. And then we just simplify. So here we get 2x natural log of x. x squared divided by x leaves us with a single x. So minus x and then over natural log of x squared. And that's our final derivative for this original function. Of course, we can see too that we're going to have to apply quotient rule alongside of other rules. Here we use the rule for the derivative of the natural log. We used power rule. We may also need to use product rule. So for instance, if we had to take the derivative, if we wanted to take the derivative of, let's say instead of this numerator, we had x squared sine of x, and then divided by, let's say, x plus 1 times cosine of x, we now have a product in both the numerator and the denominator. So when we take that derivative, we'll need to apply product rule so we'll still use quotient rule to take this derivative, but when we take the derivative of the numerator to get f prime of x, we'll use product rule to take the derivative of x squared sine of x. And when we take the derivative of the denominator here for g prime of x, we'll use product rule to take the derivative of that denominator. So we combine rules together. Now we're looking at the derivatives of the rest of the trig functions. So tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. We already looked at sine and cosine. But as a review, here are the six of them all together and their derivative formulas. We definitely want to know these. And of course, while it is helpful to have them memorized, we can use our other derivative rules to come up with these formulas if we need to. For instance, let's say that we need to figure out the derivative of secant of x because we can't remember the formula secant x tan x for the derivative. The way that we can do that is using quotient rule. So we know that secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So we would go ahead and rewrite secant and we would say secant of x is the same thing as one over cosine of x. And now we have a rational function and we can use the quotient rule to take this derivative. So we'll say that the derivative of secant of x is equal to the derivative of one over cosine of x. So we're gonna focus on the function in this form. And the derivative of that, applying quotient rule, the derivative of the numerator is 0. Then we multiply by the denominator. Then we subtract the numerator multiplied by the derivative of the denominator. Well, the denominator 
is cosine of x and its derivative is negative sine x. So we multiply by negative sine x and then we divide by the square of the denominator. So here we say cosine of x squared. And when we simplify, of course, we're going to get this whole term to cancel because we have it multiplied by zero. These negative signs will cancel and we'll end up with sine of x divided by cosine of x squared. What we can do then is split apart the factors of cosine in the denominator. We have two factors of cosine in the denominator. Let's write each one of them in its own fraction. So here we'll leave the sine of x factor in the numerator and we'll just use one of the cosine factors here and we'll pull the other cosine factor out into another fraction. And now here's where we convert back into trig functions. We know that sine over cosine is the same thing as tangent and we know that one over cosine is the same thing as secant. So look what we end up with. We end up with secant of x times tangent of x. That is the derivative formula for secant of x. So if we really can't remember this formula, we can use this reciprocal identity and then quotient rule to quickly find the derivative. So that's it for unit two. You really wanna make sure that you know how to find both average and instantaneous rate of change from functions, from tables, and from graphs, and to be able to convert back and forth between those three. You also wanna make sure that you can relate differentiability and continuity, including continuity, discontinuity, smoothness, differentiability at a particular point. And then lastly, that you can choose the correct derivative formula and then apply it correctly so that you can identify, for instance, whether or not you should be using quotient rule or product rule or quotient rule and product rule together, that you can pick the correct derivative formulas and then apply them correctly. Once you're done with the practice questions for unit two, go ahead and jump into unit three, where we'll dig into the chain rule and how to use it to differentiate a few different kinds of functions. 